So, if you use the internet, you'd probably be aware that last week we saw the release of the first two episodes of The Rings of Power, the Amazon Lord of the Rings show. And today, we'll be taking a look at that first episode. Now, this series has already become deeply controversial, with people on either side hating it or loving it. Personally, I think the thing is very well shot, well scored, and has good effects and design, but the first episode was a little slow at times and could get a bit plodding. And so, whilst it is not perfect by any means, the show starts to pick up more in episode 2. And it is by no means as bad as many people seem to be saying. And honestly, some of the nitpicks have become a bit ridiculous. But anyway, with all that being said, let's start the review. So, in typical Lord of the Rings fashion, we start off the episode with a bit of a prologue, of course, narrated by Galadriel, which pretty much builds up the beauty and the glory of Valinor during the Year of the Trees, where they lived in peace and harmony in the Undying Lands. We see young Galadriel make a paper swan boat and put it in the river to sail, only for a bunch of asshole young elves to start tossing rocks at it. Like, come on kids, why do this shit? Anyway, there is some justice here as she takes down the ringleader asshole kid and seems like she's about to lay the smack down on him. But her brother turns up to avert any bloody noses and then spouts some philosophical bullshit. And look, I loved the first two episodes, but what this guy says about stones and ships made me roll my eyes and makes him seem like a pretentious twit. But it does seem to get through to her, and she asks how she can make sure that she follows the right path, and he whispers something that's probably going to be plot relevant later on. But for now, we don't get to hear it. He then tells her that the most important truths are often simple, and that she has to learn to figure things out for herself, as he won't always be there to guide her. And that's a big call, considering in the narration later, she literally talks about how they had no word for death, because they were immortal, obviously. So I'm not really sure what he thinks is going to happen to him at this stage of the game. Like, he does end up being right, but still, big call nonetheless. He then walks over the hill, and we get a shot of a beautiful city and the shining two trees of Valinor. And yeah, the cinematography for this sequence, and really just all the sequences across the first two episodes, it's great. You can see that they've really put in a lot of time and effort, and money, into making this world look as good as they can. And I think they've really succeeded. And of course, like all things, it does go to shit, and Morgoth destroys the trees and brings war, and then is defeated off screen, and therefore has no more relevance it seems. As instead of him, it is his general, Sauron, who's the primary villain of this story. The elves then leave Valinor and sail to Middle-earth to wage war on the forces of evil. And then we have a very brief but epic battle between the elves and their allies, and the forces of the orcs, where we see Finrod fighting, we see the eagles getting wrecked by a dragon or something like that, and that's just a fun little reference to the meme of, but why don't the eagles help more? Well, that's why. Anyway, we learn the war ended up lasting centuries and left Middle-earth in ruins, which is emphasised by a shot of drowned elves, burning buildings, and a somewhat silly scene of Galadriel building an immense pyramid of empty helmets. And also, this might sound a bit callous, but I get that it's sad that all these elves perished, but in the lore, don't they resurrect in Valinor after a while anyway? Doesn't seem quite as bad when you look at it through that lens. They're still alive, just not here. Anyway, Finrod then vows to seek out Sauron to end the threat he poses to Middle-earth and he's insta-killed off-screen, which leaves Galadriel feeling pretty salty, and thus she swears revenge. And she makes her own vow to find Sauron and finish him off, and once again, yes, it is sad her brother's dead. She doesn't get to see him for a long time, but once again, it's not like he's gone forever, right? A quick voyage to the wiki says that his character in the lore does indeed come back to life in Valinor afterwards, and gets to live with his lady love, so not so bad for him. And I realise that everything has probably been simplified to make the show more accessible to everybody, but I feel like this is a basic fact about their race that can't be changed. They're immortal spirits. It's cause you're a f***ing elf! Galadriel then begins her long hunt for Sauron, and over time, her leads begin to dry up, and her followers begin to lose faith in her culminating in their last journey into the Northern Mountains, where we see her and her soldiers climbing an icy cliff in what is quite a beautiful, if palm-sweating, scene. We also learn that somehow, despite no evidence of his death, the rest of the elves just seem to not care about Sauron anymore, because that's not going to come back to bite them in the ass at all, no sir. Anyway, they reach the top, and her second-in-command, quite reasonably in my opinion, tells her that it might be time to stop and that she's led them into extreme danger, and that they should camp, shelter throughout the cold night, and consider leaving the next day. Of course, she decides it would be better for them to march head on through the snowstorm, and so they do, and then one person collapses, and it's all very dramatic. Felt very Game of Thrones. Or like when the Fellowship climbed Karadras during the Fellowship of the Ring. And then they finally stumble across the old fortress of the Orcs, a place so evil that their fire no longer warms them. 
So yeah, it definitely feels like a place you don't want to linger in then. And after some spooky wandering, Galadriel and the other guy, I don't know if they ever say his name, find the mark of Sauron, which convinces her that they should head deeper into the endless field of snow, where they'll almost certainly freeze and die. And this cements her second's decision to desert her forces and return home. And whilst I get her point that Sauron is certainly alive and building an army, I feel like he's also right here. They really do need to go back and talk to the king, and probably tell him what they found. What if they went out into the storm and all died without ever contacting and letting them know they found something? <laughs> anyway, an ice troll attacks the no-namers and whoops them all pretty good, but doesn't seem to kill anybody. Before Galadriel and the other guys save the day in a fight that was kind of cheesy all things considered. I mean, flinging her off the sword, not sure I liked that, but okay. But yeah, our first real taste of action. And I'm not really sure I liked it all that much, to be honest. It felt a bit goofy at first, and there was also obvious blood getting spilled from the troll, and yet her sword remained pristine? Is this some special elf thing I've forgotten about? Because otherwise, where's the blood on her sword? It amuses me that they wouldn't even put black blood on the blade. Like, maybe there's a tiny touch, but it's so brief. And that shit's gushing out of his neck. But there's nothing on the sword or the dagger. Do they just think that's bad optics? Did they forget? Just felt like a little bit of an oversight. She then declares that they're all going to continue on at first light, and her soldiers tell her, nope, we're going home, thanks. And so she has no choice to return with them. The title screen then plays, and we cut to some random humans walking through a field, talking about Harfoots as they pass along. And so this is our introduction to Harfoots, a race of proto-hobbits who live in the area. And damn, those fields felt very nostalgic. Yeah, it's not the Shire, but it brings me back anyway to that scene where Frodo and Sam are walking through the fields. Ah, oh, memories. Anyway, one of the Harfoots then blows a little whistle, and suddenly a tiny little town springs up out of nowhere now that the danger's passed by and they can go about their business again. And I really like this whole scene. Their culture feels very fresh and unique, whilst also somewhat linking back to the hobbits that we know and love. Anyway, the old chief guy mentions that there's a little odd that there were human travellers around at this time of year, with one of the women telling him it's a bad omen. So yeah, it is probably a bad omen of things to come, all things considered. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a show. And then another one of the Harfoots complains to her husband that a bunch of children are missing, which transitions us to the next scene, where the aforementioned young'uns are sneaking onto an old abandoned farm to steal berries. Not much to say about this scene, other than it made me want to eat berries. There's nothing quite like watching scenes of hobbits and slowly getting hungrier and hungrier. The party scene from The Fellowship of the Rings? That definitely comes to mind here. And honestly, on my first watch, all this stuff with the Harfoots, it did feel kind of boring. I wanted to see the elves again, I wanted to see that story, the rings, all that. But I think it does improve on a rewatch. It breaks up the more bleak tone of some of the storylines with something a little less serious, and something more charming. At least until we meet the stranger. As they gorge on berries, however, they stumble across wolf tracks, and so they beat a hasty retreat back to the camp. And I kind of expected this wolf to be relevant later on, and maybe it still will be, but as of the first two episodes, it definitely doesn't seem that way. And then we finally get a look at Alrond, who is still a young and up-and-coming politician at this point in the story, and seems to be the herald of the king, who writes his speeches for him. Which I found kind of amusing. Anyway, he's approached by a random elf who informs him that he cannot attend the next council session, as he's not an elf lord, which seems to get him a little bit salty. Before he's told his friend, so Galadriel, has arrived and he gets all excited and rushes off to meet her. They warmly embrace like old friends, and they briefly talk about what it's like to exist in Valinor and how he's heard that it's unlike anything that can be found in Middle-earth. A completely unique sensation. And he seems to be very eager to experience it himself, and makes me kind of sad that he has to wait so long to see and feel it. Also, he marries her daughter-in-law, right? Ugh. Her daughter that doesn't seem to exist yet. Double, ugh. Mm. Anyway, she goes on to vent to him about what happened out in the wilderness, and then shows him the mark of Sauron that she found. But then, when she feels like he's trying to stall her, she degrades him for acting like a politician, and then demands to speak to the king, before being berated by Alrond for acting entitled and going against what she'd been ordered to do. That she was being given a second chance by the king, and not to waste it. And honestly, I really don't get why the really important elves are not keen for Sauron to be found. Surely they would realise that it needs to be their priority, right? Feels like they're being hit with the idiot stick over and over. Anyway, he tells her that after the ceremony, where she and her company will be honoured by the king, he's going to arrange an audience, if it's still her wish. And then we're back to the Harfoots again, just for a little bit of exposition and character building. Setting up Nori as one of those hobbits that yearns for adventure, and a different sort of life than the one she's living right now. And yeah, I'm guessing she's going to be getting her wish sooner rather than later. We also see that as well as berries, they also seem to eat snails. 
hopefully cook snails. And we also hear that there's trouble in the Southlands. Hmm. I'm guessing that's going to be Sauron building up his orcs in the area that's eventually going to be Mordor. Moving on though, we cut back to the ceremony where Gil-galad's honouring Galadriel and her warriors, and the king's reciting the speech that Alrond wrote, with Alrond and Galadriel rightfully sharing a little smirk at that, before the king declares that the days of war are over forever. And that's a pretty big call, especially since there is literally no proof that Sauron's actually dead. And isn't he an immortal spirit? You'd think they'd know that. Surely they would have noticed that he's not gone, he's probably just hiding. Our elven heroes then have a stare down, with Galadriel eventually backing down to the king, before being told that these heroes will be sent back to Valinor in thanks for their service. So, basically they want her out of the way. And once again, sending away one of your best warriors and most devoted servants seems like a pretty shit plan, but you do you I guess. Anyway, she goes to a memorial to the warriors that fell fighting Morgoth and Sauron, and Alrond tries to console her. But she feels like she's failed her brother, and that she doesn't want to leave. That she thought her end would be here with her own memorial. But like, wouldn't all these elves have revived in Valinor by now? This isn't their end. Surely she's aware that they have immortal spirits, right? That's like their whole deal. So even if she gave her life to defeat Sauron like she expected, she'd still revive with her brother in Valinor, wouldn't she? Her and Alrond then have a slight dick measuring contest talking about all the dark things they've had to endure, trying to make the other see reason, before she tells him that there's no future for her in Valinor, that she'll never know peace until she knows for sure that Sauron's defeated, until she knows for a fact that he can't continue to raise armies and conquer the peoples of Middle-earth. But he manages to get through to her and convince her that leaving for Valinor would be the best idea, and that she'll finally be able to heal in the light of the Valar. We then travel by map to the Southlands, which seems to be the location of modern day Mordor, and is apparently a region where men were the servants of Morgoth, so I guess this area is just always doomed to follow evil no matter what. Once more, we get some great cinematography as we explore the village, and then we meet our newest protagonist, Arondir, the elf, who makes his way through the village and into what seems to be a tavern, with every man and his dog mean mugging him as he passes by. So it seems like these fellas don't particularly like elves. He then starts questioning the tavern keeper about a supposed poisoning before he's confronted by a grumpy youth who claims that the elves are oppressing them for crimes committed long in the past, and that their true king is going to return one day to cast the elves out of the land. And something tells me that their king is not going to be a pleasant person. And honestly, good chance they're going to end up as a Nazgul. Arondir then leaves and encounters Bronwyn, a human healer that he keeps giving doe eyes to, and she seems to reciprocate this. We get a little bit of exposition about the culture of the elves as they flirt, before he leaves to link back up with his companion, another elf stationed in the region, who immediately warns him that humans and elves have only ever been together twice. And both times, it ended in tears, although I'm pretty sure Alron's paternal grandparents were a human and elf couple who were very happy, and they even went to Valinor. Hal, his grandfather, was apparently such a chad that he got a special exception despite being a human, and thus is counted amongst the elves now. Or so the elves say in the wider lore, so that's a 50% success rate. I like those odds. Anyway, the pair then make their way back to the outpost, where they're told that they're leaving, and that the days of war have come to an end. Arondir then spends time brooding on top of the tower, looking out at a mountain that's surely going to be revealed as Mount Doom at some point in the future. Anyway, his commander makes an appearance and we get a little bit of backstory to the human peoples that live here, where we're told that they were servants of evil, and that many of the elves still don't trust them. In fact, his commander straight up tells him that they don't watch over this place because their ancestors supported Morgoth, but because if darkness rose again, they're certain that these people would join it without question. So it seems like on one hand, the humans hate the elves because they feel oppressed and like they're being punished for their ancestors' mistakes. But then the elves dislike the humans because they believe that they haven't changed at all. That even after all this time has passed, they're still corrupted, tainted by the darkness. We then cut back to Bronwyn's house where she's working alongside her son making a remedy of some kind before they spot a Rondir approaching the house. And it seems her son, like the rest of the village, is not a big fan of elves, which is going to make this storyline all the more awkward. And tragic in all honesty. A Rondir reveals to Bronwyn that he's leaving and then professes his love while she sheds a tear. And it's at this point that one of the men from the tavern arrives with a cow, telling them that she was grazing out east, and is now oozing black sludge from her udders. Lovely. And so off they go, whilst Theo meets up with the angry guy from earlier, and the two sneak into a barn where it's revealed that one, the whole village is talking about Bronwyn and Arondir, two, his dad ran off, and three, they have a spooky looking sword that could only possibly be a relic of evil. Like, 
Nobody's making that sword and thinking, oh, I'm the good guy. Guaranteed, these kids are going to the dark side at some point for sure. Oh, and just in case it wasn't clear enough, the mark of Sauron is also on the blade. But from Sauron to Galadriel, we see that she's indeed departed on a ship from the Grey Havens headed towards Valinor, and that Gil-galad is pretty happy about this fact, as he and Alrond had foreseen that in her pursuit of Sauron, she may in fact have inadvertently aided him in rising if she'd been allowed to stay. Alrond expresses his concerns, and very valid ones in my opinion, that this may have been a terrible mistake, only to be brushed off by the king, who clearly knows best, who then introduces him to the elven master smith, Calabrimbor, who wants his help in his next big work, which is obviously going to be the Rings of Power. But first, we of course must return to the Harfoots for a scene that I feel like was not necessary, and it basically just tells us that something bad is probably coming at some point in the future. Like, yeah, these scenes were fun, and I like the characters, but they started to bloat the show, and they definitely weren't pushing the plot forward in any real meaningful way. We then cut back to Bronwyn and Arondir as they approach Hordurn, where it's revealed that Bronwyn is originally from the town, and Arondir sort of insults her and her people by calling them notable Morgoth supporters. Not the greatest way to woo a woman, but sure mate, you do you. But he does manage to recover until they stumble across the village burnt to a crisp. So, yeah, I'd hazard a guess that Sauron's here, and he's breeding himself a fresh army of orcs to begin his conquest again. We then have a pretty epic scene where Galadriel's party is about to cross over into Valinor. Alf maidens then strip him of their armor and weapons, which Galadriel's not keen to part with, but after getting glared at by her second in command, she relents, and then the most, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, Christian scene I've ever seen in a fantasy thing plays out. The sky opens up, white gulls fly past the boat, they're engulfed by warm golden light, enveloped in music, and they all start to sing a hymn. It was really incredible, and more than any other scene, this one felt like Tolkien's world to me. Anyway, as they start to enter the realm, she starts to regret leaving, and hears her brother's voice telling her what he told her when she was a child, so that we the audience could hear this time. That sometimes, to know the light to follow, you need to touch the darkness. And meanwhile, we see a fiery meteor flying through the sky, watched by the various different important characters, with the meteor crashing near Nori's village. Whilst Galadriel gives the Valar the middle finger and jumps off the boat into the Sundering Sea, which is like, how could she possibly expect to swim back? Anyway, in my opinion, the point where she breaks into the water, that's where the episode should have ended. It was the perfect time. Gil-galad looking at a corrupted leaf and Nori approaching the crash site, that could have been left for episode 2, I think. Anyway, there's a naked dude in the crash site, and that's going to either be Sauron or a blue wizard by my guess, but we'll have to wait and see on that score. And so yeah. A good start. A little slow in plotting at times, but they had a lot of characters to introduce and a lot of story exposition to set up. It wasn't perfect, but nowhere near as bad as people are saying. And so, with all that being said, that's the end of the video, and I would like to remind you that these are just my opinions, and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the first episode? Like it? Hate it? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and let me know.